Hello, everyone, from wherever you're joining. Thank you for being here today for this NCAR Explorer Series conversation, quantifying and improving travel safety using computer technology with Dr. Curtis Walker. My name is Dr. Dan Zitlow, and I'm an education specialist here with the National Center for Atmospheric Research, or NCAR, which is a world leading organization dedicated to understanding Earth system science. So that includes our atmosphere, weather, climate, the sun, and the importance of all of these systems to our society. I'm really glad y'all could be here today to learn more about the impact weather has on roads and emerging transportation technologies. For this event, you'll be able to ask Curtis questions throughout using the Slido platform. If you scroll down this webpage, you can see the Slido window just below where you are seeing the live stream video of this event. If you haven't already, go ahead and click on the green join event button, and then you can ask questions on the Q&A tab and answer poll questions on the polls tab, both of which are found in that blue bar across the top. And definitely be sure to join Slido to add your thoughts to our work cloud question. What do you think of when you hear road weather? Because we're going to get to that very soon. This lecture is also being recorded and will be available on the NCAR Explorer Series website. With us today, we have NCAR scientist, Dr. Curtis Walker from the Research Applications Laboratory, or RAL. Dr. Walker is a project scientist specializing in research at the intersections of transportation, weather, climate, and artificial intelligence. He brings over 11 years of surface transportation meteorology research, development, and project management experience. Dr. Walker earned a PhD in Earth and Atmospheric Sciences with a meteorology climatology specialization from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln in 2018. He has since worked on many surface transportation projects to advance technologies that will improve road safety for drivers, including a collaboration with the Nebraska Department of Transportation to develop a, weather, a winter severity index. Dr. Walker is also a member of many professional societies, including the American Society of Civil Engineers, the American Meteorological Society, Association of American Geographers, Intelligent Transportation Society of America, Transportation Research Board, and American Geophysical Union. So Curtis, can you turn on your camera and give us a, a quick hello before we check out that work cloud question? Yeah, sounds great. Thank you so much, Dan. And it's certainly great to be here with you all. Um, again, welcome wherever you're watching. And I'm looking forward to tonight's conversation. Awesome. So, Paul, can you pull up that uh, work cloud for us? All right. So some of the answers I haven't seen, potholes, <laughs> uh, weather and its impact on road safety and drivability, uh, automated vehicles, hazards, safety, uh, Curtis, how does how does that sound uh, sound to you? I like potholes. That's that's the number one in my book. Um, but yeah, I think uh, we definitely have a great audience tonight, and all of those um, we're we're going to talk about all of them. And yeah, potholes are indeed a weather related issue with freeze and thaw. <laughs> yeah, they are. We're just going to at the end of you know construction season too to to fix all the potholes. Um, so thanks for those responses to that work cloud question. We have a poll question coming up in just a little bit. So make sure uh, y'all have, have answered that. Um, but so, so Curtis, you, you work in the research applications lab, you know, here, here at NCAR, uh, focusing on surface transportation weather. So could you tell us a little bit about how you became interested in doing this type of work? Yeah, absolutely. And, and to answer that question, I'll, I'll share some slides here with you all um, that, that really review the work. So um, yeah, let's dive on in and uh, hit the road, as they say. And so to, you know, to lead off, um, tonight we'll be talking about improving travel safety using different forms of technology. And this picture goes back to November, 2019, my family's uh, Thanksgiving trip from Colorado back to Nebraska. And this is what the interstate looked like, I-80 traveling across Nebraska. And you know, boy, this was before the era of Zoom Thanksgiving and Zoom holidays with the pandemic. Um, but I certainly would have rather not do that drive because you can tell um, it was certainly a mess. And so maybe a little bit more kind of about my background. You've heard a lot of this already, but I did wanna share in addition to my current role at NCAR, more recently in my professional history, I was an advanced study program postdoc at NCAR, really paved the way for my opportunity to be here in my current capacity now. And also I had a brief stint with the Colorado Department of Transportation as a maintenance and operations, meteorology and weather operations intern. 
And so that was a really great opportunity to combine the research and science that I've learned with the actual real world boots on the ground forecasting. And my academic history, Nebraska, where I earned my graduate degrees. But before that, um, I grew up in the New York City area. And so it was actually there um, on the East Coast that I really found this love and passion for all things transportation, as well as inclement weather. And so to walk you through maybe a little bit of photo history um, of my upbringing, this is a picture from my neighborhood in Queens, Queens, New York. Um, I'm sad that the Mets lost the, the playoffs, of course. Um, but this is an image from the Long Island Expressway or Interstate 495 through Queens that runs from Midtown Manhattan out to the east end of Long Island. And anytime there was a snowstorm, my dad and I would always go out, take pictures, and I would just be in awe of the, the carnage um, and, and the impacts there. And so we see here, you know, a van facing the wrong way. Um, these are pictures from the infamous day after Christmas blizzard. Um, we didn't have a white Christmas, but we had a white uh, boxing day, I guess, or day after. And associated with this snowstorm, it really snarled public transportation, um, huge impacts. So we had buses that were stranded in snow drifts. We had law enforcement vehicles that were, you know, covered in snow and uh, plowed in quite well. And really, as a, from a young age onward, I've always had this passion and interest for both transportation and weather. But as I went through my career, Certainly as high impact weather events occurred, like the unfortunate impacts of Hurricane Katrina in 2005 in the New Orleans, uh, Louisiana area that turned streets into rivers, or closer to home in upstate New York, where I also have family, um, the remnants of tropical systems Lee and Irene in 2011, that resulted in significant um, inland and river flooding. And more recently, the impacts of Hurricane Sandy and its aftermath in the New York City area that completely um, blacked out significant portions of lower Manhattan and resulted in some pretty significant flooding. And then as my travels took me to Nebraska, um, not my photo, but that of uh, Matt Coker, and the twin tornadoes of, of Pilger Wisner in 2014. And so adding on this passion for, okay, from winter weather to hydrologic extremes to severe convective weather, how do all of these affect roads and people? And we know that when we look at winter weather impacts, whether we're talking decades ago or just in the last decade, um, the impacts here on Long Lakeshore Drive in the Chicago, Illinois metropolitan area are the exact same. And we know that every year, there's going to unfortunately be some kind of extreme weather impact somewhere out there um, in the world and in the country. And so now that my travels have taken me to Colorado, uh, certainly Colorado is no stranger to the extremes, whether it's from plowable hail um, that can fall in the spring or summertime, um, to the unfortunate impacts that we've had to deal with, you know, locally in the Boulder County community more recently of wildfires. And so this was actually a time lapse that I took from my phone in the in-car parking lot, looking at the Calwood fire. Now this was back in 2020, um, and you can see the smoke plume here. And you know, this was certainly much closer to home. Um, I live in Southwest Longmont. And so at one point there was that question of, you know, could, could the fire get to where I live? And of course, at the time the answer was no, well, the fire stays in the mountain, right? But we of course know those of us local in the Boulder, Colorado area, we unfortunately had to deal with the impacts of the Marshall fire. Um, not even a full year ago. And that was absolutely a case where the fire did not stay, um, unfortunately, on the foothills, but did come into communities. And so this was a picture from my apartment complex back during the Calwood fire, but really taking stock of how do we move people? How do we safely evacuate people from all kinds of weather hazards? Um, it really comes down to safety and people's lives and also the economic implications as well. And so when we think of transportation meteorology in the news to put some highlights, it, it ranges everywhere from the, the relatively minor inconvenience in the grand scheme of things, being stranded on the road or having a really tough trip home for the holidays, to unfortunately the more catastrophic incidents such as vehicular pileups and loss of life um, that are associated with these hazards as well. And then also it's important to consider the economic impacts and implications of these events as well. And so this was an article from a couple of years ago now that shows Interstate 80 through Wyoming. And because of the truck traffic, the supply chain, um, keeping the toilet paper on the shelves that we need so much, 
that every hour I-80 is closed, the trucking industry loses about a million dollars. And there are times that I-80 has been closed upwards of um, one to two weeks during, say, a really severe winter season. And so um, all of this from the, from the impact perspective to the personal experience has really been what's gotten me interested um, in, that, in this field. Wow. And, Oops, sorry, Curtis. <laughs> no. Well, and I was going to say, just when we look at the impacts of adverse weather on the roads, I really like showing this chart because it really puts numbers on it and it really quantifies it. And so what we have here is the number of average annual fatalities in increments of 1,000 on the vertical axis tracked during the period from 2007 to 2016. And the takeaway here is that when we look at the number of direct fatalities that are tracked by the National Weather Service from weather hazards, things like flooding, lightning, tornadoes, and hurricanes, never to diminish any loss of life, but when you factor in the indirect fatalities that are attributable to weather-related crashes on the roadways, you're dealing with an order of magnitude greater. Now, these crashes could be that they happen during precipitation, rain, snow, sleet, or what have you. They could have happened due to a pavement condition that was something other than dry. So perhaps the roads were slick or icy or slippery in some way. And then there's kind of the, the third hazard environment, if you will, in which it could have been low visibility conditions with fog or blowing dust or high winds that could blow vehicles over. And so when we look in the United States, about 21% or one in five highway crashes is in some way attributable to weather conditions. And so in addition to the safety implications, this is millions of crashes per year, hundreds of thousands of injuries, and significant economic, environmental, and societal cost as well. Yeah, which leads us right into a, a poll question we had, we had asked our audience uh, about some of this, the, the stuff that we were just talking about. Uh, you know, what percentage of highway crashes can be attributed to, to weather? Um, so Paul, could you bring that up for us real quick? Yeah, and it looks like uh, a lot of our audience agreed about a quarter of, of uh, you know, the, those highway crashes can be attributed to weather, which is quite a lot, actually. Like that, that's a lot more, I guess, than I expected. Um, so I, I, what exactly, you, you've talked about it a little bit, but like what exactly is this kind of service transportation weather and like why, why is this so important to understand, particularly, I guess, as we, we start moving more and more towards, you know, automating our transportation needs. Yeah, certainly. Let me, let me go into maybe a, a bit further detail here um, and jump back into the slide deck. Um, let's make sure I go into the slide deck. There we go. And so, yeah, to, you know, to address that more broadly, it's not just the safety implications or the, the operational pieces of the hazards, um, but there's also the infrastructure as well. So um, this is a picture um, actually from that same Thanksgiving trip. So, you know, clearly I should have just not gone, right? Um, but this is actually a bridge that washed out um, in the area of some family due to some um, shifting and mass movement associated with recent rainfall that had occurred. But when we look broadly at the weather impacts to roads and drivers, it really takes kind of two forms. There's the vehicle impacts, so the loss of control or traction or friction or your handling and maneuverability, being able to do those things that you're used to doing on a dry road during a sunny day. But then there's also the driver and human behavior factors um, that can unfortunately also include human error as well, such as your situational awareness and heavy rain and blinding conditions. Maybe you're not aware of how close you are to the vehicle in front of you, or, or you are following too closely for the conditions. Um, all of those things that law enforcement like to tell folks when they get pulled over. But there's also then you know traveling too fast for the conditions or having to take abrupt or evasive action because maybe the vehicle in front of you starts to slide or maybe an animal crosses your road. Uh, your, road in front of you as well. And so, you know, when we look at the prospects, as you mentioned, Dan, about automated vehicles and the future of our transportation and mobility space, we see that self-driving cars certainly have the potential uh, maybe to overcome some of these challenges. So in the vehicle impact space, using artificial intelligence to be able to appropriately adjust the engine power, the torque, and the braking to compensate for road conditions. We can program those algorithms um, to try to have that human experience. And perhaps one of the 
the bigger assets is the ability for these platforms to communicate with other vehicles and to be able to identify and react to changing conditions. Now, in terms of that human dimensions piece, we can use, again, the suite of sensors that are on these self-driving cars from LIDAR and radar and digital base maps to really have that this concept of localization, basically knowing where your vehicle is relative to fixed objects, but also other objects out there as well. So being able to identify objects and other vehicles beyond what the human eye might be able to detect. And then also adjusting the speed appropriately for weather conditions. Now, for those of you that might not be familiar with the, the suite of mobility technology out there, I do want to review just at a high level, you might hear these two terms of connected vehicles and autonomous vehicles, or even putting the two together. And an autonomous vehicle is one in which it operates in isolation from other vehicles, and it relies on its internal sensors and algorithms. So again, whether this is cameras or LIDAR or radar, it does the processing of sensing the world around it and safely navigating that world. Whereas the connected vehicle communicates with other vehicles and or with fixed infrastructure. So for example, maybe your vehicle knows, hey, this traffic light's about to change against me. And so I'm gonna start slowing down so I don't run a red light or have to slam on my brakes. And then it's that connected aut automated vehicle or CAV that puts these technologies together um, to navigate its environment. Now, in terms of the levels of automation that are out there, there are five. And currently, in terms of the commercial, commercially available vehicles out there, um, not to pick on Tesla, but that's the one that everyone knows, and Teslas fall in uh, level two, or partial automation, in which they can do many of the driving functions um, autonomously, but they still require the human driver. So there are no commercially available um, higher, uh, higher level autonomous vehicles out there currently. Um, there's a lot of testing going on and in select pilot cities, um, many of which are in the Sun Belt, aka not harsh weather conditions. Um, there are certainly a lot more higher levels that are out there. Um, but it's when we get to these highest levels of automation from four to five that we talk about you know, completely removing the human driver, completely removing the steering wheel as well. Um, but weather presents a certainly a challenge for all of these technologies. And so case in point, looking locally, um, our local transportation agency, RTD here in the Denver area, actually tried an automated shuttle out. And this is a blurb from a report in which there were numerous service disruptions because things like snow, heavy rain and steam generated by melting snow led to the vehicle to interpret those weather events to be obstacles in the path of the vehicle. So obviously, um, may, maybe it was safe that it you know, wasn't trying to drive through, say, snowflakes, but that's not very reliable in terms of the expectations of people in society. And so you know, some of the maybe future challenges of this space is when we look at the weather community and the automated vehicle community is, you know, who's gonna provide the weather information? Is it going to be the National Weather Service? Um, is it going to be private sector entities that maybe form business relationships and partnerships with one another? And then we also get into the you know, nebulous waters of who's gonna collect and store this information? Is it gonna be the property of the vehicle manufacturer, your, your Ford, your General Motors? Is it gonna be the property of you, the owner? Um, or is it gonna be the property of the insurance company so that they can cull through the data um, when things do go wrong and make determinations about claims and what have you? Um, so it's really gonna be an, an exciting, but also a challenging world in terms of the future that awaits um, with looking at you know, how can we better integrate weather into these autonomous mobility platforms. Cool. So it, it sounds like, you know, we, we would really need the, the car to know <laughs> uh, quite a lot of things. I know we had a poll question for, for our audience about this. Uh, so Paul, could you bring, bring that question up about, um, you know, what our audience thinks self-driving cars will need to know to safely drive down the road? Um, yeah, so it looks like 100% said all of the above. <laughs> so current weather conditions, other vehicles on the road, and the wetness and dryness of the road. Um, any other uh, things that a car might want to know, Curtis? I, I really like all of the above. Um, it, it's the catch-all, and you know, teachers in school always tell you, you know, never, never select all of the above, right? It's a trick question, um, but not <laughs> in this case. Your vehicle is going to need to know everything. Yeah. 
Um, great. So I don't I don't see any uh, audience questions quite yet. Uh, so if again anybody in the audience has has a question, please go ahead, pop it in the Slido. We'll we'll definitely try and get to it. Um, and also just another, we have another poll question coming up uh, here soon in in a little bit. Um, but but Curtis, I I imagine that like what an emergency vehicle might need to know is very different than like maybe what I would need to know as, as I commute or as I get on a bus to commute. Um, so ha have you thought about some of those like different transportation use cases and, and how things might be different for each? Yeah, absolutely. And that's actually where some of the, the fascinating research uh, possibilities are. And so, you know, to demonstrate this, I, I want the audience and you to, you know, really think about these next few use cases. And so when we think of this automated vehicle space, you know, let's consider different resolution. And so let's say in these four cases, right, we have freight and supply chain. So we have the truck that's going from New York to LA carrying your iPhones or something like that. Then we have transit, kind of that urban space, maybe regional. So commuting from the suburbs to the city center for work. Um, and then we have at kind of this finest scale, your emergency services. So you never know when someone's going to call 911, but when they do, you have to get there quickly, safely, and efficiently. Um, and then there's kind of this catch-all high impact weather. And so in this space, when we you know, think about that, that largest spatial domain, this kind of nationwide weather needs for freight, for trucking, for supply chain and logistics, we really need long range planning but one of the common themes you're gonna see at the heart of all of these is route optimization. How do we get from A to B using the least amount of energy, whether that is electric powered vehicles, gas powered vehicles, or what have you in the future. And also how do we get there safely? Um, so least cost, fastest time and safest. Now, when we go to that kind of more regional scale, thinking of transit again, regional weather information, kind of this mid-range planning horizon. Um, what are you gonna need for your, you know, say self-driving buses or bus fleet this week? Um, or think of it as, as a school district as well, getting kids to and from. Um, again, route optimization is gonna be essential. And then again, to that, really localized um, kind of short range or tactical planning horizon. Route optimization again is important, but consideration of the weather is essential. And then last but not least, when we get to this high impact horizon, there's the question of with all the sensors, with all the knowledge and all the technology, your vehicle might know, hey, there's a road here and I can be on it. Even if I can't see the road because it's raining heavily, it's snowing heavily, I know that there's a road and I'm getting from point A to B. However, your vehicle has to also know just because there's a road there doesn't mean you should be on it. And so case in point here, whether you have destructive hail, baseball size or larger, or perhaps you have a tornado crossing the road in front of you, um, maybe you have a flooded road or any other type of hazard, your vehicle should know that it needs to stop um, because that is going to be the safer course of action, or maybe it needs to detour or reroute entirely. And so again, back to this question of that's a lot of other decision making that your vehicle has to do other than let me drive straight, drive the speed limit and not hit the car next to me or in front of me. Um, and so it's it's these different use cases that really push the envelope. And so it culminates in the automated vehicle space in this concept of operational design domain or ODD. And ODD can be simply described as it's the specific conditions for which an automated vehicle is designed to safely operate under. So think back again to those levels of automation and depending on the level will somewhat govern what the ODD is. And so this can be factors like road type. Are we on a two lane interstate 75 mile per hour speed limit? Or are we on a six lane highway in a busy urban area with a 55 mile per hour speed limit um, and lots of traffic? And again, weather is gonna be a part and a component of that ODD as well. And so to understand this concept of operational design domain, we really wanna be able to quantify the weather into different regimes. And so this is where I'll spend a, a good chunk of, you know, kind of the rest of the time we have here um, talking about some of the ways in which we are able to um, quantify and categorize the weather. Yeah. And yeah, go ahead. Dan. Oh, I was just saying, as, as we move into this next section, I know we had uh, we had asked the audience a, a question about 
uh, a time when maybe they were traveling in severe weather and and what one piece of information did they really wish they had that would be helpful uh, during that trip um so paul could you pull that up really quick as, as we transition to this next section here Yeah, so the first, will I make it out alive? And that that's a great, I've, I don't know, Curtis, if you've had this experience, but I've driven in some pretty gnarly <laughs> snowstorms before. Um, how icy are the roads? Yeah, that's a super great one, particularly when we think about like, um, you know, ice that you might not be able to see on the road very easily. Um, you know, how the weather will actually interact with the roads. Will it freeze? Will it melt? Is the snow going to stick or is the rain going to freeze? Uh, road conditions in real time on my journey. Will it rain? Um, other other drivers can be very helpful. All it takes is a split second to have an accident. Uh, do you have any uh, initial reactions to any of that, Curtis? Yeah, I, I really like the will I make it out alive. Um, for me, this is a, this is the curse and the burden of my field. I'm always when I drive now, I'm like, oh, I don't want to be one of my statistics. I, I don't want to slide off the road when it snows or, you know, rear in the person in front of me uh, because I couldn't stop in time. And so, right. you know, certainly in our in our hybrid and virtual environment, it's much easier to maybe not drive um, during inclement weather. Um, but yeah, I, I do try to avoid um, not so much rain, um, even though rain is actually a bigger hazard even than snow and ice. But definitely if there's a forecast of snow and ice out there, um, I try to stay off the roads. And so um, I agree with all of these. And my hope is that in the future, we'll be able to provide um, answers to all of these questions. Maybe the make it out alive one, the answer will be don't go out and you'll stay alive. Yeah, and, and and thanks to our audience for for sharing your, your thoughts on this. Um, so yeah, so so back to you, Curtis. We're we're about to dive into the journey of, of your research. So can you uh, tell us a little bit about uh, more of the specifics about the work that you do? Yeah, absolutely. And so let me lead off with the slide I I left this concept of weather severity and disease, and so. Generally summed up, weather severity indices are a way in which we can quantify the weather conditions, their severity, their impact for a variety of applications. This can be for risk communication. It could be for decision support. It can be for emergency planning or recovery and resilience. And so let's look at some of the weather severity indices that folks might be familiar with already. And so really when we look at this severity index space, we have a variety of scales out there um, that are in some way weather severity. Now, some of these might be more of an intensity or more of a wind speed scale, but in some fashion, they're a way to communicate perceived risk and impact. And so we have the Saffir Simpson um, with hurricanes and tropical systems. We have the tornado, the EF scale which categorizes damage, um, it's a damage index. So after a tornado has hit a community or hit structures, um, National Weather Service uh, folks go out there and categorize what they're seeing. More benign weather conditions, such as heat and cold extremes. We have um, the wind chill or the heat index, which um, heat and cold extremes absolutely lead and contribute to loss of life as well. Um, and then maybe some scales that folks are less familiar with would be things like, say, the drought index. Um, certainly those with agricultural interests are, are much more, and water resource, are much more sensitive to this one. And then where I'll spend a, quite a bit of time is talking about um, more recent tools, such as winter storm severity indices. But before I go more into those, I do want to show, you know, my favorite index. Uh, this is a picture um, taken by my graduate advisor, Mark Anderson. Um, I've taken a similar picture now though myself, but this is outside the National Weather Service in Cheyenne and in the office, um, you know, if the chain isn't uh, at a 90 degree angle, um, it's broken, notify meteorologists. Um, you know, 75 degree angle, beware of low flying trains. Um, but um, if it's, you know, perfectly perpendicular, welcome to Wyoming, it's a windy place. Um, that, that too is a severity index, right? But when we look at and focus on winter and winter storms, um, this work I'll take you through was, you know, it, it was a roller coaster ride. And we know that a, that a winter season could be a roller coaster where we have maybe lots of little storms or we never know, maybe we'll have that big one. 
And so when we sum up over the course of a winter season, all that's occurred, you know, we could have an average winter, we could have an above average winter, cold and snowy, or maybe a below average winter. Um, now, below average, just because it's warm doesn't mean we didn't get a lot of precipitation as well. So maybe it wasn't a lot of snow, but perhaps a lot of rain fell instead. And so this is the project that really um, had an opportunity for me to kind of take off in this field in my career, in which we developed one of these indices, a, a winter severity index for the Nebraska DOT. And so as part of this project, we identified storms from our baseline period, a, a 10 winter season period from October 2006 through April of 2016. And we determined the important meteorological or weather variables and combined them to classify a winter severity index or a storm index first, and then kind of a seasonal statewide index. And so when we computed the final index, we could look at it from a variety of spatial and or temporal scales from monthly and seasonal to daily. And again, from statewide or more targeted regions within the state as well. Um, and we're able to compare that index with well, what were the winter maintenance operations? How much did the DOT spend and things like that? And so this image here shows you the six category framework that we developed for the Nebraska DOT. And the takeaway is that in this six category framework, we looked at various parameters, things like road access or condition or traffic speeds or whether or not the DOT is meeting their objectives. And we came up with a way to frame from these lower impact or kind of trace and marginal scale um, up to higher impact or moderate and high impact storms where you do have significant issues. Um, now, if you're wondering out there, you know, why six categories and why these headers? Well, we really wanted to borrow and leverage um, the state of Nebraska is in Tornado Alley. And so they were very aware of the Storm Prediction Center and those categories that they put out for whether or not there'll be a tornado or large hail or damaging winds. And so we simply borrowed that framework that existed and adapted it to winter storms um, for a comparison. Now I'll say, since this work, the National Weather Service has developed a winter storm severity index of its own out there, uh, but it's been certainly great collaborations and great conversations looking forward. And so in terms of classifying the weather parameters, one of the challenges we had was we didn't want to just make an index for Nebraska. We wanted to make an index that any state would be able to use and adapt on its own. And so you'll notice here, you might say, oh, where are the numbers? Why are there just text? And it's because, again, we wanted this flexible framework. And so case in point, snowfall. You know, a dusting of snow for a place like Nebraska or Chicago or New York is going to be a relatively minor impact. However, a dusting of snow for a place that's not used to snow, perhaps somewhere in the Southeast, Atlanta, Oklahoma, Texas, not to pick on anyone that's not used to snow from a climatological perspective, but a dusting of snow in those places is gonna have a much more significant impact than it might in other places out there in the country. And so we came up with this framework to be flexible. The other thing we did was we directly engaged with our Nebraska DOT partners and had them help us by ranking and assigning weights to the different parameters we were looking at. And so they told us that these first three here from things like snowfall amount being the most important um, or the most impactful to their operations, followed by the rate, how fast the snow is coming down and then the wind speed as well, make up the top three most important parameters. And then when we look at some of the other parameters, you know, the spatial extent, how much area the snow is covering or was being impacted by snow, while still important, was of a much lesser importance. And what this weighting allows us to do then is to combine all of the input data and come up with a single number to represent the storm. And by coming up with that single number to represent the storm, going back to our six categories that we developed, what we see here is when we compare any winter season to another, we could look at, say, in this case, the 2009-10 winter season, and we see that there were, you know, a lot of those little storms and a few of those bigger storms. We could compare that to another winter where we see a similar distribution 
of the events, but we noticed that the numbers from say year to year can be much smaller, um, where maybe we had a winter where we didn't have any of those biggest or most impactful storms, um, but we still had some. And so to show you this full framework of the Nebraska Winter Severity Index, what we, what we called NWINS um, for short, again, we combine those seven parameters to classify these storm events and then to come up with a single number to represent the entire winter season, we simply took each category as a weighting function for then the frequency of events. And given the total number of events, divide by 100 to get a nice number between 1 to 10. And so when we look at that final value, we see here um, the Nebraska index we developed. And this is data from 2006 through um, kind of a couple, a few years beyond that original development period. And the takeaway is this black dash line shows the average for the period. And so when we take the height of each bar or the departure from that average, we get the anomaly. And it's really in this image where we can see that roller coaster plain as day, where we have uh, years and periods that are maybe above average. We come back down to a below average period, back up to above you know, down to below and then back up again, at least in these data. And so we can see periods where maybe there's a lot more expense from a maintenance perspective, or maybe there's a lot more safety issues from having lots of winter storms um, to then years where there's not as much of an issue. Now, if we think back to the automated vehicle space though, it's important to set the baseline threshold of what what kind of conditions does our vehicle have to account for in any given year? Is it gonna be experiencing a likely a period of above average winter season or below average winter weather? Now, the other component, as I mentioned at the beginning was, we also wanted to make sure we developed a flexible framework that was transferable to other locations. And so we applied the same framework, but went with the state of Colorado. And the takeaway here is on the top row, we have five winter seasons of Nebraska storm distributions. And on the bottom row, we have five, those same five seasons with Colorado. And the takeaway is that the framework produces a similar, whoops, the framework produces a similar um, distribution, although albeit the numbers are different. Now, as you saw in that quick preview there, um, we can do the same analysis of looking at the year to year distribution. We can look at those anomalies, but, by using the same framework for adjacent states, we can also do side-by-side -side comparisons. So here we have the Nebraska numbers as the blue bar and the Colorado as the red. Um, Nebraska's go big red, but I wanted to flip the colors up just for a bit. And so by also comparing those anomalies, this lets us get a sense more regionally and geographically of where did maybe two neighboring states, one had an above average winter and one had a below average winter. And again, really giving us that sense and that picture of what's happening where and when. Yet from this framework at a high level, we can also extend it to other hazards as well. And so a current ongoing project is to apply that winter storm framework now to roadway flooding severity. And so for this, um, this image comes from the road to Atlantic City, New Jersey, during um, Hurricane Sandy back in 2012. And flooding among the direct fatalities is one of the leading causes. And you'll see here from these statistics, most people, unfortunately, that lose their lives during flooding events, majority of that is associated with driving. And so that's why we have robust campaigns from the National Weather Service and others such as turn around, don't drown. Never try to drive your vehicle through floodwaters. However, there are some times where floodwaters, flash flooding, case in point, can come up very quickly and catch motorists off guard as well. Um, and so there's always this psychological factor of someone has to be, you know, car number zero that makes a decision, I'm going to stop and not travel the road because um, I don't want to end up in a situation that is unsafe. And so what we're trying to do as part of this project is to combine hydrometeorological data um, from modeling that includes things like precipitation, stream flow, soil moisture, and snow melt, and couple it with traffic mobility data. So um, maybe user reported incidents. If you're, if you're like me and you like Waze and you know, putting those uh, police reported ahead, 
signs, you can also put in weather information such as hail or ice on the road or a flooded road if you encounter it. And also then integrating different information such as vehicle speeds, um, travel time and traffic volume as well, and come up with a similar framework, very similar to what you've seen before um, with the winter storm index now doing the same for roadway flooding. And so one of the preliminary cases, you, you might notice I have a Nebraska bias in my research, but it's uh, it's because I have family and friends there that send me the great pictures of, you know, hey, this weather is impacting us or hey, this is happening. And so back in March 2019, um, those of us in Colorado experienced the, the bomb cyclone. Um, however, it resulted in a, a rain on snow event and some rapid snow melt um, and some catastrophic flooding in the Midwest, Nebraska, Iowa vicinity. And so for this event, this first image here, focus simply on the size of the circles. And so this is from our retrospective modeling of this March 2019 case. And where we see larger circles is indicative of where we had higher flow rates or higher stream flows. And I certainly want to acknowledge my colleagues, Aaron Taller and Aubrey Duggar here at NCAR um, that, that helped and have led this part of the analysis. Now, where we have the larger circles, that's indicative of where we have a flooding problem. Now let's transition to where the color of the circles is important because as I mentioned, the image on the left is from a retrospective model, a model we've run historically. And the image at the right is from real-time observation. So we wanna see how well does our model correlate with real-time observations. And the takeaway here is that generally we see a lot of darker purple colors. So our model's doing pretty good. However, you'll notice that downstream um, in places around, say, the St. Louis, Missouri area, we, we have less correlation there, and that's because of human action. So when the Army Corps of Engineer either raises floodgates, lowers floodgates, or what have you, um, the model is not able to accurately capture that human and water resource management component, but otherwise does pretty well. Now, at a high level, if we look at kind of the mobility side of this case study, on the left, we have a trend analysis. Uh, green road segments are good. Yellow, orange, and red are bad. We have a lot of congestion there. And when we look at, say, this event relative to the same period a year later, we, of course, have the caveat with the pandemic. But if we zoom in on a couple of areas at the left and compare that with images on the ground of what was occurring with the flooding situation here, and we can see that portions of the western Omaha, Nebraska metropolitan area, um, highway interchanges completely underwater, or if we go kind of south of the Omaha metropolitan area along the Missouri River, we can see this is the community of Plattsmouth, Nebraska, and uh, there should be interstate roadway here. And you can see satellite images of the floodwaters. Um, and then last but not least, some of the more rural communities that are outside of the metro area, again, experience some significant flooding with you know, water over the hood of a semi-trailer. And so some very huge impacts with this case. But now if we wanna do a deeper dive into some of that mobility data, and again, wanna acknowledge my colleagues along the way, this put together by Amanda Seems Anderson. And this shows us, this image at the right shows us those flood reports from Waze. And so we see that on the, on the big day of the event, we have the greatest number of flood reports. And then there's reduction. Now keep in mind here, roads are closed at this point. People are heeding the advisories, stay off the road, stay home and et cetera. Um, there was some secondary flooding over the weekend that resulted due to dams failing um, and levees bursting as well in the aftermath. But when we look at some of the other data, things like Waze reports or road closed, we can get a sense of, hey, we can start to see how that flooding is impacting mobility. Now, we still have a ways to go in this analysis to actually get to that final point of, okay, now let's put the index together and let's put the numbers. But one final piece I wanna overview is this notion of, let's also rely on traffic cameras. Let's use the infinite power of social media, um, whether it's you know, Twitter pictures that people put out there, Snap stories, Instagram, or what have you. Let's use cameras to tell us what weather is occurring when it changes. Um, as one of my other colleagues, Gary Wiener has said, improve the picture of now. And so 
um, this is another analysis with a, another colleague outside of NCAR, um, Luvere Walker Hannon, in which we've done a series of kind of image processing and difference assessments. And so this first case comes from Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And, and Dan, I'm going to pick on you here now. Um, I'm ready. See, if, see if you're paying attention. <laughs> um, tell me in this image, what, what do you see from a, from a weather perspective? Well, you know, I'll, I'll make it easy. There's a beer truck in the middle that it's beer clock, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. So it looks like, uh, there's a little bit of standing water kind of in the, in the breakdown lanes, but the actual road looks kind of okay. Like dry ish. Okay, yeah. And like, I, I don't know, the sky in the background, you can kind of see in that upper left hand corner looks, I don't know, not clear, but not super overcast either. Yeah, no, pretty good summary. Um, all right, same shot about 90 minutes later now. Tell me what changed or what do you see now? Ooh, well, there's a <laughs> there's a raindrop on the camera. So I'm assuming it's now maybe raining and, and that the roads are kind of damp and wet. Yeah, you kind of, you don't see that, you know, defined standing water anymore. Yeah. You're getting a little bit of shine. Um, if you look over here, you can even see some road spray coming up from that traffic mm. uh, on the other side there. And so absolutely, yeah, pretty good job. And so if we, you know, if we move this forward and do a difference of these images, we can start to understand things like, okay, not only has the beer truck moved on, um, but if you look at the road showing up in kind of this blue cyan color, we can tell our algorithms, hey, there's been a change in the state of the road. Um, we can teach our algorithms, hey, this was a change from a dry road to a wet road. Um, or we can do it with, with, say, snowfall as well. And so um, this next case coming out of Nebraska, um, I, I won't pick on you again this time, Dan, but in this case, um, again, a similar story where we have an image, um, we can see things, you know, there's, there's a truck in the median there actually. Um, there's a freight train below, but if we look at the bridge deck, notice that the kind of breakdown lane to even the exit lane here, um, this is traffic coming towards you. Lincoln's over here and Omaha's kind of behind the camera, um, but traffic going Lincoln to Omaha, there's quite a bit of snow in the breakdown lane, a little bit of snow in that left lane. 90 minutes later, we see that the, there's much less snow on that bridge deck. And so all of this to summarize that, again, if we do that difference assessment, thinking about self-driving cars, well, in the first image, we'd want to tell our self-driving car, you know, travel in the number one or two lane, maybe don't travel in the left lane because it could be slick and maybe that increases the likelihood of a wreck. Um, but 90 minutes later, we can safely say, hey, you know what, things have improved, the snow stopped and the, uh, the snow is starting to get off the road there. Nebraska DOT is doing a really great job. And so, you know, it, it all comes down to, you know, why does all of this, um, you know, why does all of this matter? And it matters first and foremost because of people, because of you, because of me, but also because as we look forward to the future, your vehicle is going to need this real-time, predictive, and hyper-local information to navigate its environment. And so this accurate weather is going to be the key to safety. And so in this mock-up um, from another colleague, from actually a, a graduate student, Brittany Welch, um, that we've had the pleasure to collaborate with here at NCAR, um, she's developed a blowover algorithm. And so this is a framework that looks at combining roadside weather information with vehicle information to issue risk alerts for um, is your pickup truck with an RV or a trailer likely to blow over or maybe you're worried about a blowover with your large semi trucks and commercial vehicles. Um, this is just one of the many types of systems that are out there that whether it's conventional or future automated vehicles are going to need. And so, you know, maybe I'll leave you with some closing thoughts here um, and, and happy to take questions. But, you know, transportation agencies and the weather enterprise have some, you know, really unique challenges, but those same challenges are opportunities as well um, for research and development with connected vehicles, with automated vehicles. And you'll notice, you know, I've left out electric vehicles largely from this talk because that's a whole other conversation um, and a whole other, you know, area of excitement. Um, but we also know that future weather conditions, climate change are gonna to continue to threaten the safe and reliable operation and infrastructure that's out there. And so we're gonna need broadly trained scientists and engineers um, to really address 
what what the future holds. And so, um, you know, again, I'll, I'll look forward to you know any audience questions here, but I do also want to make sure that I share my um, contact information so that if you know anyone is interested out there um, in following up in due time, you know, feel free to reach out, send an email, um, ring the phone as well if if you're if you prefer. Um, and yeah, no, definitely. Thanks, Dan, for the chance to, you know, have this conversation with you. Um, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you now. Yeah, and th thanks so much for, for being here. I, I, I remember when we first started talking about some of your work, I was just like, this is so cool. Like, I, I never even really, you know, made the connection, right, between like, me driving down the road and maybe like the, the the weather conditions that I might actually want to know about before I start driving down the road. Um, so we have, we got about uh, just under ten minutes left uh, together, and I, I do see a couple questions uh, from from our audience. So looking at our, our top rated one from AJ, um, I know you've talked a little bit about you know needing, needing to know weather conditions and kind of positionality data as well as you know, reports and traffic cams that you, you get some of that from. Uh, but can you maybe summarize for us, like what data do you need to do your research and how do you collect these data? Yeah, so to, to summarize, right, the data kind of takes maybe three forms. There's the weather data side. Um, in terms of how that's collected, luckily a lot of it's collected for us by roadside weather information stations or RWIS. Um, it can also be collected from vehicles as well. Um, some vehicles have mobile sensors that give us temperature, road friction, um, pavement condition information as well. And so yeah, we're quite fortunate that there's a wealth of weather data out there. And then of course, there's also the weather forecast itself. Kind of the second area then is gonna be that mobility data um, information such as highway speeds or how fast traffic's flowing, travel times, traffic volumes. And again, a lot of that is collected out there, um, some by transportation agencies, some of it's done by third party vendors as well that do um, you know, anonymous uh, cell phone tracking. So every time you click agree, when you install a mobile app on your phone, um, you should read what, ex what exactly you're agreeing to. Because a lot of times it's aggregate data about your location, um, which can feed in some of these algorithms. And then kind of the third piece of data is that, you know, I'll say the internet of things, it's that other data, it's traffic cameras, it's those crowdsourcing and social media data um, and other reports about what people are seeing and experiencing on the road and, you know, hashtag blizzard, hashtag road is closed or what have you. Um, and it's that wealth of data and information that can help, um, help guide a lot of the research that we're interested in doing. Great, thanks for that. Um, so our next question is from Dylan, who's asking, are there any climatological indicators like ENSO or the El Nino Southern Oscillation uh, that can be used to predict what uh, the this weather severity indices that you were talking about earlier uh, might be for the coming winter? Yeah, um, thanks for the question, Dylan. And so among colleagues um, that are out there in the university community and at NCAR, we've definitely had strong interest in okay, from this weather severity index, how do we now look at those teleconnection patterns you mentioned to try to predict, um, maybe now there's a lot of interest in the sub-seasonal to seasonal um, prediction space. And so can we predict a season out or several months out what we might anticipate in terms of winter severity over the course of a season. And so of course, um, as you mentioned, Enso, La Nina, El Nino has some broad implications, but those aren't the only teleconnections out there. Um, and some ongoing and active research has demonstrated some capability in getting to that weather severity impact from those teleconnections. Great, and our next question comes from Amory, who's <laughs> and I can relate to this. I'm reminded of that time when there was a road closure in Colorado and it like routed everybody into like a dirt field. <laughs> um, so with route optimization, how do you mitigate sending all traffic to a different route and causing volume issues? That is the huge uh, crutch of the problem there. So if you have an answer, I'm certainly uh, open for that. Um, it was actually just earlier today, um, the Federal Highway Administration's Road Weather Management Program had a webinar on this topic. And um, as you alluded to, Dan, yeah, you know, we have to factor things like 
We don't want your, you know, navigation app sending you down a dirt road. We have to be cautious here in Colorado, I-70, when, um, when you know, Vail Pass closes or, or the Eisenhower Tunnel, um, you can't have large commercial trucks going Loveland Pass, uh, that kind of, you know, work around. And so there's so many factors that have to go in in terms of it's not just, is the road open or is it, or is it not? And how do I get there? Um, but another example I want to share is the Nebraska DOT has actively worked with some navigation partners to discourage people from taking alternatives. Um, so, for example, if Interstate 80 closes, well, there are several other east-west roads, Highway 6, Highway 30, Highway 34. But the problem is those are two-lane roads. And it's like if the interstate's closing because of weather, that two-lane road that's, you know, a mile off the interstate is also probably closed or not a good idea to travel on. And so we really need to take the narrative to, instead of trying to find the better way um, during some events, the answer is simply to you know, adjust the travel schedule, either travel before the storm or delay travel and travel safely after the storm. Um, and yeah, how do we get that messaging? That's the, the fun of the research. It's part it's the science, it's the tech side, and then it's also the social science side. And again, that human dimensions of how do we communicate and convey risk to people out there and different populations. Trucker has to travel and earn a living and deliver your Amazon Prime package. Um, you wanting to you know, travel to go fishing or something, yeah, maybe that's a bit more discretionary. And our, it looks like our next question is from Bob, who's uh, asking most mesoscale and local driving de decisions are road condition dependent rather than weather related. Is there an intent to create a driving condition index? Yeah, definitely. Um, that's certainly a great point. And I I'll welcome the opportunity to maybe collaborate on that because right now, um, as you've seen, right, much of the weather index that was developed was all atmospheric conditions with a couple of others such as duration and spatial area. Um, but absolutely getting to that, okay, what about, you know, after a snowstorm, we have blowing and drifting that might be 24 to 48 hours after it snows and the roads are still covered in ice. What do we do in that scenario? Um, so absolutely, you know, kind of the next logical piece is, okay, how do we get then um, a more, integrated index that looks at the totality of, of the meteorological circumstance and the resultant uh, impacts as well. Um, so I'll say I'm very interested in it. There's been some development in that space, but um, I'll absolutely welcome ideas if you have more. And we got two more questions uh, left, one from the audience and one that I'm interested in asking you. Um, so our, our last one from the audience is from Lorena, uh, which is a great question when it comes to us thinking about what communities are, are we actually serving. Um, so Lorena is aware that there are translations for severe weather, like tornadoes or other types of severe warnings. Um, are the categories and severity indices that you mentioned uh, being translated into Spanish? Um, so not presently, at least not to my knowledge, um, but absolutely reaching the diverse audience of communities that are out there um, and traveling is a huge issue. And, and something we've actually come, um, come to find is that some of the National Weather Service offices are struggling tremendously um, with non-native English speakers because um, because of the trucker shortage and kind of the, the personnel shortage that seems to just be existing in every industry, there are a lot of non-native English speakers that are now um, driving trucks. And while on a clear day, that's great. When there's inclement weather, when a road is closed, when it's wet, that's a huge challenge. And so um, National Weather Service and transportation agencies need to be effective communicators. And so um, I think absolutely that too is another arena for making sure that the science is accessible um, and readily available to all, regardless of what your familiarity um, or, or language might be. Great. And uh, last question in, in the last minute that we have together. Um, if, if I were a student that was interested in this type of work, uh, what, what advice would you maybe give them? Yeah, you know, ho hopefully you came to this or you'll see it in, in the archives, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, it had in my own academic road, it hasn't been easy because it's not as big of a field as, say, 
hurricanes, tornadoes, um, and kind of the bigger fields that are um, getting maybe a lot more attention at the moment. However, with that said, um, net, it might sound cliche, but networking is key and fundamental because the hope is that even if you, know, you yourself maybe aren't here at this talk, that among connections like your advisors, like faculty within your department, through the grapevine, perhaps someone can get you connected with um, a resource um, that, that has more interest in this space. Maybe eventually um, we'll get connected as well. And so that's why I hear, um, you know, sharing my email um, on the last slide, you know, I'll welcome folks to reach out to me and, you know, really dig deep. And um, if you're looking for internships or job programs out there, you know, Google is your uh, best friend. And so, you know, I'm certainly aware that some transportation agencies and companies, whether it's airlines, whether it's shipping companies, there's a surprising number of transportation related or transportation meteorology related internships out there um, that I wasn't aware of as a student. And I'm like, oh, that would have been great. You know, would have set me on my career path a heck of a lot earlier. Um, but definitely Google leveraging your network and you know, if you're curious about it, um, do your best to you know, try to find out what's out there. And hopefully along the way, you'll make great connections. Um, and again, please feel free to you know, count me as one of them. And, and with that, Curtis, thank you so much for being here today to, to chat to us about road weather and just all the really cool things that, that you're working on right now. Yeah, thanks for having me, Dan. And again, yeah, thanks for coming everyone. Um, hope you all have a good night and of course, travel safe. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and thanks to, to Lisa and Holly uh, for, for your comments. I'm, I'm so grateful that uh, you, you enjoyed our conversation here. Um, and also thanks to the, the team behind the scenes, Paul and Aaliyah, for supporting uh, Curtis and I today. And if you're interested in more NCAR Explorer Series events, definitely check out our website for upcoming lectures and conversations, as well as to view past recordings. And so with that, I hope to see you all next time. Have a great rest of your day. And like Curtis said, travel safe.